It's 12 noon, and this is City Line. Hi, I'm Jackie Hall. And I'm B.T. Bentley. Could we get along without religion, without the prayer, the church, and the worship? Many individuals think so. They call themselves atheists, and they believe in reason that there is no God. Today on City Line, we'll discuss the spread of atheism, especially in the black community. Joining us is Deborah Clark of the American Atheist Society of Separationists. Also joining us as a special audience guest is Father Carl Fisher of St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church. We'll find out why atheists advocate separation of church and state. And why many see religion as hypocritical and mere hype. The NAACP brings its national convention to Baltimore next week. I'm T. Montier, and today on Newscap, we'll look at the focus of the convention. Do you remember the popular hit tunes, Fool's Paradise, and Once You Get Started by Chaka Khan and Rufus? Hi, I'm Harold Anthony with you, and today I'll introduce you to the lyricist of those songs as Gavin Christopher debuts his first solo effort, One Step Closer to You. Stay tuned for this special feature on today's edition of the Entertainment Page. And join me today on City Line in a special interview with Congressman William Gray, a Philadelphia Democrat who chairs the House Committee on the Budget. But first, Blacks and Atheism, up next on City Line. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for this edition of City Line. I think we're in for a very interesting discussion this afternoon. Uh, with us is Ms. Deborah Clark, who, as I said, represents the American Atheists. Uh, greater D.C. chapter. Greater D.C. chapter. Okay. Let, let's begin by making sure that we're speaking on the same terms and tell us what an atheist is. Yes, I need to tell you what an atheist is because dictionary definitions of atheism are usually written by theists. Atheism means without theism, the Greek prefix a meaning without theism meaning the belief in a god or gods okay. that uh, prefix might be familiar to you mm -hmm. in the words uh, asymmetrical apolitical uh, means without so I'm live without God beliefs okay have you always lived without God beliefs uh, well I was born atheist as mm -hmm. everyone was and I remember my first indoctrination as a young youngster I began to be indoctrinated into uh, the Catholic faith. Now, uh, doubts accumulated from the age of about five on, and then finally, as I reached my teen years, uh, it, it sort of hit me that uh, this, especially Christianity, was a glorification of human suffering in the uh, crucifixion of a human being being displayed all over the school, and I began to feel that it were, there were other aspects which were not satisfying and that uh, perhaps I should be an agnostic. And later on, as I couldn't bring myself, no matter how hard I tried, to believe in a God I had to admit to myself that I am an atheist and I've been much more relaxed ever since. Okay, now you made a, a rather blanket statement uh, earlier. You said that we are all born as atheists. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, we're all born without religion. We don't have religion until we're taught that there is or may be a God looking down on us, judging all of our actions, and that there's a hell and a life after death. And by the way, these concepts are not unique to Christianity. A casual, any casual exploration in the library will show that hundreds of years before the Christian era, there have been prophets, uh, like such as uh, Zoroaster, who said that there was a heaven and hell and an almighty always watching all of your actions. Uh, Lao Tse said, turn the other cheek. And uh, all of our values that uh, work in society. Now, you said that you questioned early on, mm -hmm. from five on, and in your teen years, it was also additional questioning. And you mentioned the term agnostic, yes. which is merely what? Well, agnosticism has a couple of different definitions. Uh, Spencer, I believe, uh, uses the term to mean uh, not knowing or, or not uh, wishing to commit as, as to doubting. whether 
doubting that there is a deity? Yeah, I guess that's a way of saying it. It's a way of saying nothing, really. I mean, when a person is asked, do you believe in God, the agnostic, perhaps not believing in God, will say, I'm an agnostic, which that means uh, without knowledge. Without knowledge. Yeah. Why do you think you passed over, you went from Christianity, passing over the, the whole spectrum of agnosticism to atheism? What was it that, in quotation marks, sold you on becoming an atheist as opposed to an agnostic? What was the thing that sealed it for you in terms of your information and, and your beliefs? Well, I, th I think two things. First of all, no evidence that there is a God. And secondly, the evil influences of religion in, in society. I saw that most of the problems, the public issues, were uh, quibbles, moral quibbles, where none need exist. And today, I think this, the same thing's going on. What, uh, what kind of example? I mean, can you give us an example of what you mean by well, that? Well, a, a couple of good examples. One is uh, the family. I was taught at first that the family is a basic unit of society. I, I, at the time, I, I questioned it. Isn't the individual the basic <laughs> unit of a human society? We come in units of one. And uh, I get so tired of seeing the black people disparage because, oh, the women are the head of the household. And I don't see anything wrong with that mm -hmm. in itself. There's nothing, if that's the way it is, I don't see why we should be criticized for having a women-headed household. And I, I think it's more and more normal all the time. But religion doesn't question that, does it? Oh, absolutely. In what sense? Well, in the main book that all of the Christians read, uh, the Christianism book, known as the Bible, the Bible. Uh, it's stated in many places, and if you want more information exactly where slavery is laid down in the Bible and where the patriarchy is demanded, in the Bible, just right to the post office box, 23118, Washington, D.C., 20026. That's our local chapter. We'll send you, if you'd like, we have an X-rated Bible where all the filth in the Bible about foreskins, uh, incest, abuse, child abuse is all in here in the X-rated Bible. And you can see and consult with your own Bible okay, that it's there. We're going to get a little bit deeper into this issue, but we have to take a break right now. We'll come back with Father Carl Fisher in just a minute. Please stay with us. with our guest Deborah Clark and we're talking about black atheism. Uh, we kind of laid down the premise of uh, atheism and so forth. Now, those who believe in religion believe at the center of the universe or the center of whatever is a god, whatever name by which we call him. What is at the center of your being, of your existence, uh, of an atheist's existence? Yes, I, well I think my own consciousness is all is at the center myself is at the center i perceive the world and i enjoy the world and i enjoy my life does that in any way give connection to what transpired before your being and what will transpire after your being i know nothing of what happened before i was born and I'm sure I won't experience death. So there's no connection to anything that preceded now, you? Only this life counts. And I, that is where religion is so detrimental to the black community. Religion demands attention to a higher force, a mythical higher force. Attention, energy, always be thinking of this uh, higher force. It's very detrimental and distracting. It distracts our economic resources. It distracts our psychological resources. Religion demands that people recognize their sinfulness and their evilness, the implicit evilness of the human being. An atheist sees that all of our problems are solved by human reason, and we are able to solve all of our problems, and we might as well get cracking and do it. This uh, pre prayer, were you going to? I was going to ask, in terms of, of dealing with moral issues and so forth, what source or, or, or what... Uh, uh, authority do you tend 
uh, to uh, get your moral beliefs and, and uh, so forth from? It doesn't take much. Common sense. We know what it takes to be a good citizen in this society. We already have secular laws to tell us that. But didn't those, most of those secular laws grow out of uh, religious uh, doctrines? Those are the laws we must nullify. Those laws that say that, that want to regulate human relationships ought to be nullified. Laws that demand we take oaths to a higher authority don't allow for a pluralistic society. That's the, that's the whole point of separation of state and church, to allow for individuals to live according to law and still keep their various different beliefs. Now, we see a trend now where uh, uh, certain religious rightists want everyone to live just as they do in their narrow set of lifestyle. And I don't think it's fair, and I, I don't think it allows for a pluralistic society. Okay. Now, you think that atheism, then, is the answer for black people? It certainly is. It, why, why do you believe, though, that religion has held black people back? Hasn't it always been the foundation in the black community? In Maryland, in 1695, the first laws were passed to prohibit black people from assembling. In, by 1809, blacks were allowed to assemble under the supervision of a white person. By 1843, those laws said that all right, blacks could worship under the supervision of a, of a white person. Now, this took out all the possibilities of different societies, drama societies. In Baltimore, it was a little more liberal. They says, okay, you may have your meetings, but under the supervision of a policeman who will report to the mayor. By 1946, after I imagine black people decided, oh yeah, well we're going to make so many societies, you won't be able to keep track of us. The law was passed, no social clubs, no moral societies, but that's no state, drama isn't it? clubs. How, how does that uh, speak to the, the churches holding back blacks? I'm saying that for a long time, church was the only alternative. It's inhibited our development in other areas, scientific areas. None, and the churches certainly didn't put up much of a, of a fight. They want black people to be submissive and obedient. And so do these religious rightists. They want, they're afraid of human individual, uh, individuality. They're afraid of what might happen. They think humans are, are, are wild animals. They think humans are not capable of living in society. Okay, as mentioned, uh, we've uh, been joined in the studio audience by uh, Father Carl Fisher. Uh, and, and Father Fisher, I'd like to ask you, uh, considering a lot, has been, a lot has been said, but uh, if, if you could direct yourself to some of the uh, uh, discussion that we've had so far uh, from the uh, Catholic Church's point of view. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, the reason I'm in the audience and not up on the set is because Ms. Clark objected to my being seated up there. I think that in itself pre uh, indicates that Ms. Clark does have some sense of moral code or some kind of values that she would, in effect, deny really existed. I think she made the statement that people are born atheists. I think that we can see from human reason that uh, that is not true. It is so innate within the human person, within the human personality, that there is an awareness of God then within the human person. Then why do we need person. Bible schools? The, why the do we need Sunday schools? The, why do we need church? We already have it. You're saying we don't need these sermons. We don't need the Word to tell us how to live. We've already got it. I don't think that's The too very far. fact that a man can know of the existence of God from human reason is the point I'm making. Uh, the whole meaning of agnosticism is the fact that agnostics feel that we cannot demonstrate from reason the existence of God. Persons who possessed m minimal rational thinking ability can come to a conclusion that God does indeed exist. It is innate within the human personality uh, from the very point of reason, All we can come senses, to realize there that there is, is an order in the world within the universe. That tells that us, if you don't mind, I'm excuse speaking. Excuse me, please. but of but course, order in the universe exists. Natural laws exist. It does not mean that a god necessarily created that order. I can look at a flower and say, "Isn't it beautiful?" A god must have made it. 
That is jumping to conclusions. That Who flower is there. Who created that flower then? That flower, flower grew from, from a that flower grew from a seed. And where did, where the, did seed the seed come, come from? from? The seed came from the parent of the flower. And, on, and where did that come that, from? I don't know. Obviously, you don't know, I and that's exactly know. your problem. And you don't I'm know. not going to make up stories about it. I'm going to admit that I don't know the answer, and I'm going to continue to explore this world and find out. The great Greek writer Socrates said, the beginning of wisdom is the admission of ignorance. So I'm happy to hear that you don't know. I think that we have many sources, those of us who believe in God, uh, to certainly support and to deepen what we know is a fact that God does indeed exist. We know from divine revelation, excuse the person, me, the historical me. person divine of Jesus Christ, would you the historical person of Jesus Christ. Divine, he, Jesus Christ is not a historical person. Father, please, the main issue you know, here, what's easily asserted the main is issue easily here denied. is <laughs> that the irrational beliefs of religion should not be foisted upon all citizens. You're free to believe if you like. However, I do not wish to live under your narrow codes of lifestyle, which says that I must have a man over me to support me, which says that I am a sinner and not worthy of perfection, not even worthy of striving to even think of trying for it, not to believe that this world is coming to an end and it doesn't matter. When black people have rage, the church suppresses that rage. It says, accept. That's wrong. Black people's rage should be channeled to changing the conditions that cause injustice. And I, I really resent the, the attempt of religionists to, okay, to suppress Okay, the we're going to come back and continue this in just a minute. We do have to take a break. Certainly Please stay justified. with us. We'll be right back. The subject is black atheism, and just before the break, we heard from uh, Father Carl Fisher. And Father Fisher, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, one of the things that uh, Deborah Clark said was that uh, religion is an inhibitor to the black community, meaning that it pretty much holds black people back. This has been a, a contention that's been held through the years, through the ages, that the religion is an opiate of the people. How do you respond to that? First of all, I, I would totally deny that. True religion. There have been many sins committed in the name of religion, <gasps> and I think that every Christian person would be the first to admit that. But the whole concept of a religion, the whole concept of a loving relationship with a God is designed to free the human person. It is not designed to suppress. It is not designed to hold people back. It is designed to enable man to very naturally respond to the full fulfillment of his human potential. And we are guided in that because of the fact that man is not perfect. We hold have it, beyond right us, there. we have hold beyond right us there. another force. Men and are, that is the force men and of God. Women, Father, that is the force perfect. of God. Men and women to are perfect human be beings. And in fact, the church the does not encourage response. The church is not a group of clubs which are politically active. You know, with all due respect to you, you know, one of the things that you're guilty of doing, I use the word guilty, especially what? with regards to you, is the fact we, that you are not, preaching, you are in fact preaching guilty. your own moral code, I trying to impose your own sense father. of values and I'm not upon guilty. us. May I, may At I the I same time, to lay that guilt claiming upon that me. you're not may even I attempting to do that. The way you Excuse make your me. Living. Excuse me, Ms. Clark. May I interject? And I'm wondering whether or not I'm hearing something here. You have a set of beliefs. You have a set of beliefs. But she denies is, beliefs. Excuse me, Father Fisher. Yeah. Is there a slight intolerance from both ends here of one other? Have beliefs? you ever seen an atheist on a religious talk show? Is there a certain intolerance have from you each ever other? seen? You know, the atheist interesting thing is that obviously in we the are press. diametrically have you opposed. Ever seen, she says there is no God. You see we know there is a God. Explained in the media. Okay. There is intolerance here, and it's not on my part. Okay. <laughs> it's on the part of the religious establishment, which censors. And another thing, if this is here with the more unhealthy attributes of religion, that unhealthy attitude about sex, is there really a reason to ban nudity? Is there really a reason that people can't be educated about birth control? 
We should want to know everything there is to know about our bodies. Why should it be so dirty? The Bible calls sex dirty. If you want the X-rated Bible, write to the post office. We box. categorically We've deny that. Got God all never the quotes created from the Bible anything of all that was the foreskins, the dirty sex, uh, rape. It's all in the Bible. Now, the Ms. human Clark body is treated dirty. as is that not, dirt. Is that not all pushing a moral the code, Bible. a sense of values? And not that only she denies that, she has. slavery is upheld in the Bible. Okay, How do you think the South Africans get away with what okay, they're doing? Okay, let's do this. Why don't we give a few seconds to wrap up and a few seconds to wrap up this end of it, and let's try to move on to a few more issues that are still outstanding. Father Fisher? First of all, it's interesting that uh, Ms. Clark obviously is pushing her own code of standards while denying that she's doing that very thing. I haven't That's exactly explained what my she's code doing. of standards. Uh, I have said nothing about it's, my code it's, of standards. It's interesting. Father, it's interesting you have plenty of opportunity that, uh, to expound. In, I don't. And I insist on clarifying my position. I'm not the only black atheist in history. It's interesting, the lack of respect that is obviously evident with us is due, I think, in part because of the fact that if one does not believe in God, that one is not bound to common standards of decency and respect How for the human person. How can you person. say that I'm not bound to common no standards is bound. of decency? There is I'm no, sitting here There is no clothed. motivation I to do anything that is right and I am proper. a law-abiding citizen. There are no consequences. I care about my fellow Thank human you. beings. How can you say I have no standards? Okay. It's slander. That's what it is. You don't know my standards. You don't, you don't know my values. You, the, the hatred, you are the contempt there that you have for me, me is so evident, and that speaks louder. I must speak louder. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Father Fisher. <laughs> All the thank time. You, you had it. <laughs> you, uh, I, I, any other points that? Well, you? I'd like to mention that an interesting area of uh, exploration would you, be. You the, obviously take issue. You're very, you're very. Uh, you mean I disagree? Yes. I. Religionists have a tendency to categorize atheists and say, oh, they have no standards, they have no morals, you can't live without the, the, the word of God. It's not true. Ethics. Is that at the base, the, the basis? Ethics of is a system of deciding what is valuable and how human conduct can, now, can be productive. Now, let me ask you. Productive. Why should blacks find atheism appealing? What would... What would blacks find in atheism? What it would do would take people away from the distraction of religion. It would take people, it would allow people to concentrate their energies on self-improvement, not worship an outside imaginary deity. We need to concentrate our efforts in our own selves, in our own community, thinking and participating in the political process. Our viewpoint is valuable. Okay, that, that uh, being accepted, your viewpoint is valuable, but I seem, As a black I, seem atheist, black to, I seem to sense that the intolerance goes beyond uh, uh, mere uh, antagonism between you, uh, atheists, and uh, believers in God, and not being willing or able to accept Listen, them having their beliefs and you having it's your It's not beliefs. atheists who burn Christians. It's the other way around. Christians burn and harass atheists. You could have advertised in college bulletin boards that there would be an atheist welcome to talk. That would have been taken down because the church does not teach people how to be good American citizens. The church does not teach people to allow for diversity in society. Okay, we're going to take a, a question from home, someone who'd like to talk with you. Hi, okay. caller. Caller? Hello, man. You're on the air. You can go ahead now. Yes, I was wondering, okay, the uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Croft mentioned that what, where she came from is not too important. I was wondering how does she feel about death? Where does she think she's going to go? When I die, my, the blood will stop circulating in my brain. I will be unconscious. Eventually, all of the life processes will stop. My heart will stop, my breathing will stop, and I will not be able to think anymore. I will be unconscious. Soon I'll rot away. I you may really care. You don't look forward to any future after death. Absolutely not. There's nothing to look forward to. Oh, okay. I have one more. I'm here now, and this is the main, main show here. Okay, thank you. I have one more statement, just a statement to make, please. Okay, you're concerned with people believing in what they can't see or believing in something that's not there. I do say that God is a title, okay? You have to believe there is a supreme being, okay? Just that I have to believe that? I believe, oh yeah, there are supreme believe, beings. You have to believe, you human have to, beings are supreme. Not see. Human being is a supreme 
being on this planet. Human beings have control of the planet now. We are the supreme beings. You must not be. Listen to this. In December, okay? No, I think caller. Like the end of October, you put on your coat because something hits your skin that you don't see. You see the effect. You don't see it. You don't see where it's coming from. But you put on your coat because you feel it. You have to feel that it is something here higher than man. Okay, why do I have to feel that? Thank you for the call. I hope you said so. Okay, bye-bye. Well, why do I have to feel that? One, one last question. How did you get here? Well, my parents got how did together they got one night. How did they get here? Their parents. Okay. You, one night, they, or it might have been in the afternoon. How did your family roots start? Human beings evolved, just like all life forms on Earth. That's as much as we know now. Okay. Life evolved from the muck of the uh, of the earth. Effluvium. <laughs> yeah. Deborah Clark, thank you so much. Thank you. You okay. have indeed excited us to thinking. Yes. And I'd like to refer to two uh, magazines that are published by the American Atheist, and the magazine is entitled American Atheist. If you like further reading, try to look these up. Thank you for coming by City Line. Thank you. We're going to take a break now and go to T. Montier in the newsroom. Good afternoon. Topping today's news cap. When the NAACP convenes its national convention here in Baltimore next week, nearly 20,000 people are expected to attend. But what will be the convention objective? What are those people expected to leave with? Joining me now to discuss the overall focus of the convention is Felicia Kessel, National Public Relations Director for the NAACP. Ms. Kessel, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. What is the focus of this NAACP convention? Our theme this year is building toward one society. And we hope that when people leave this convention, they will have a better sense of the NAACP, the work that it has done, that it continues to do, and they understand what they are about and what this society needs to still work on. For our viewers, specifically, what kinds of topics will be covered at the convention? How is the convention structured? All right, well, there are several parts of the convention. Uh, the convention takes place June 29th through July 3rd, five days. We have plenary sessions going on all of those five days where our delegates from our 2,200 units across the country come to meet, plan strategies, and take votes on what will the NAACP agenda be for the future. We have speakers, very prominent speakers, coming in to advise us on the most important and pertinent issues. Those are open to the public, and we have people coming in like Gary Hart, like uh, your governor here, and the mayor from Washington, D.C., a number of people, both local and national, to advise us and inform us of these issues. In addition, we have the Commerce and Industry Show. 
that is where over 300 corporations put up displays and exhibits where people come through and sample their products. They have a chance to talk with representatives from these corporations. It's a, a very exciting part of our convention. And in addition, we have workshops in all of the program areas of the NAACP. There is our AXO competitions, where, which is our youth competitions. A whole lot going on, plenty of food. And local vendors will be able to uh, exhibit their products where you will find uh, particularly ethnic products that you cannot find in other areas, except during our convention most of the time. You mentioned structuring an objective for the future. How has the mission of the NAACP changed over the years? I do not believe that the mission has changed. I think what has happened is that we've moved into an implementation phase, meaning that during the 60s, of course, we were sitting in, we were boycotting, we were marching in order to get laws down on the books to protect our rights and move us toward full citizenship. Implementation now, if that is to maintain those rights, uh, the recent uh, five years, there's been a rollback. So it is not dramatic what you see. It is not something that the media can show you on television. However, it must be done. Our lawyers continue to work with the courts to maintain those rights. There are those who would question the validity of the NAACP today, 1986. To those people who show no special concern for the NAACP or special interest, those people who possibly should, how do you address their questions? I'd like them to come down to the convention. Uh, we've always had people who have questioned the validity of the NAACP. Uh, however, we stand by our record. We have over 450,000 members. We are here for 77 years, and we continue to be here and expect to always be here until, of course, we have full citizenship for everyone. One particularly interesting aspect of the convention will be the culmination of the March for Human Dignity in South Africa. You mentioned to me earlier that the NAACP has been in the forefront of the situation in South Africa in terms of its concern. Tell us a little bit about that March for Human Dignity. Uh, this year, our voter education department, uh, under the direction of Joe Madison, has launched a march across the country. We've had several marches before, none of this extent, starting from California and culminating here at this year's convention. Uh, these are a core group of marchers. They represent mothers, children, students, the dispossessed, walking across the country and motorcading in order to emphasize the importance of the votes. This is what we've worked for so hard. We do this also to bring attention to our brothers and sisters in South Africa who are without the vote. Without participation in the voting process, nothing will take change, nothing will, nothing will happen. So this is why we're doing this. We have been in the fight since 1911 with uh, South Africa trying to work out Africa's problems. So we feel that this definitely is something this year that is of tantamount importance. For anyone who would like more information on the convention or on the march, is there a number that they can call? Yes, they can call area code 301. 358-8900, that is the national headquarters main information number, and they can reach me at that number if they ask for Felicia Kessel. Felicia Kessel, National Public Relations Director for the NAACP. Welcome to Baltimore, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. I'm T. Montier, and that is today's newscap. More of City Lineup next. Have a good afternoon. Okay, hey, that was an exciting discussion that we had, and of course the information yeah. that T. Montier brought to us is very good as well. You have a special report. You interviewed Congressman William Grant. That's right, not too long ago. It was my pleasure to uh, meet him in his office and have a chance to talk with him. Looking forward to your report. Well, it may seem for black Marylanders that they're losing the most important voice they have in Congress when Perry Mitchell retires from Washington. There are other black congressmen who are similarly strident in their efforts to represent minority interests. One of them is Congressman William Gray, a four-term Democrat, representing Philadelphia's 2nd District. The 49-year-old Baptist minister quickly earned the esteem of his colleagues, something that is evident by his election to the chairmanship of the pivotal House Committee on the Budget. Traditional accolades aside, the most telling compliment Gray has received is that of being mentioned in more than a few quarters as a potential future presidential nominee. 
I had a chance to talk with Congressman Gray recently in Washington, just before his budget committee began final discussion of the 1987 federal budget. Congressman Gray, you're a fourth term uh, congressman from the state of Pennsylvania. You're serving on one of the, as chairman of one of the uh, most important uh, House committees that on the budget. Uh, how is it possible to uh, represent black interests while having to represent uh, such overall interests as, as a whole country on the budget committee? Well, it's very easy. Uh, black interests are no different from human interests. And so therefore, uh, in the budget process, when I'm determining how much money there will be for all the housing programs in America, I'm affecting black people. Mm -hmm. I'm affecting public housing, but public housing is not relegated to black people. You know, one of the great myths is that, you know, there are black folk issues. There are issues of people that have a disproportionate impact upon certain groups. And so therefore, when you look at public housing, one of the myths is that black folk, that's their issue. Mm -hmm. The majority of people who live in public housing in America are not black, they're white. The that majority of people on welfare in America are not black, they're white. The average welfare recipient in America is an 18-year-old white woman, 18 to 22, with two children. Now, of course, in many of our major cities, like mine, Philadelphia, or Baltimore, or New York, when you think of somebody on welfare, you think of somebody black, because that's what you see. Mm -hmm. But what you don't recognize is that there's another 80% of America that's not represented by big cities. And there are people there on welfare. And those people are white. So thus, when you affect welfare, there would be those in Philadelphia or Baltimore who would say, hey, that's a black issue, and you're affecting us. In a real sense, it's not, because the majority of people on welfare are white. So you're affecting people who are low income and need some support. The same thing is true with health care, nutrition, education, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are very few programs in the federal government that are, quote, directed only at blacks. Your name has appeared on a number of lists as a prospective presidential candidate. Uh, is that something that you perceive is, is happening sometime in the future? Oh, I'm flattered by all that mention, but, uh, you know, I'm from North Philadelphia, and in North Philadelphia, uh, as an old basketball player, I've been taught you play one game at a time. Don't look at the next game or next month's game. You better worry about today's game. And I've got a big job as chairman of the budget committee, and that is putting together a trillion dollar budget, setting the priorities of the nation, how much we're going to spend in education, whether or not we're going to go along with the Ronald Reagan approach uh, to fiscal priorities. Uh, where he wanted to eliminate urban mass transit, where he wanted to eliminate UDAG grants, where he wanted to eliminate uh, programs like the SBA that helps minority business, where he wanted to eliminate and cut back uh, programs like job training, the Job Corps, uh, whether you cut back by 30 percent Pell grants that are directed at economically, socially disadvantaged students to go uh, to Howard University, to Morgan State, or to Johns Hopkins. Poor kids, uh, many of them happen to be black. A lot of them also are white. Uh, well, when you sit in this chair, you can write a budget that says, no, Mr. President, we're not going to make those choices. There are other choices. And so I'm just trying to play this one as well as I can and do it as good a job as possible and, and really change this fiscal policy that is, I think, distorting what the values and the principles of America are. Let's switch gears for a second. Uh, let's talk about foreign affairs. Give me a report card on the Reagan administration, specifically about South Africa. We've got an absolutely disastrous policy there, uh, which is a policy called constructive engagement, which I basically call uh, hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil about racial apartheid in South Africa, and which basically supports uh, the apartheid oppression, the racial oppression of the 27 million majority by 4 million minority. Uh, I think that is disastrous for our interests economically, strategically, in that region of the world, but also in terms of the geopolitical consideration of East versus West. It sends the message that the United States is willing to light candles, and rightfully so, for those oppressed in Poland, but we're not willing to strike a match for those oppressed in South Africa.
the United States, rightfully so, is willing to speak out against the oppression of a Sakharov, Anna Sharansky, and thank God Anatoly Sharansky is free today. Mm -hmm. However, we won't raise our voice with the same vigor, the same volume, with regard to the oppression of a Nelson and Winnie Mandela. And what that does is it sends a signal to the rest of the world that we have uh, two standards for human rights. One if you're from Europe, and one if you're from South Africa, and you happen to be black. That is a disastrous policy that has deep implications, not only for South Africa, but for all of Africa, for all of Asia, and for all of Central and Latin America, which we must correct. And I don't think Americans, not just black Americans, but all Americans, don't want their bank loans, their companies, their universities investing in a system that has that kind of oppression. Bill Gray exudes a certain confidence as he discusses the issues, and his opinions on a variety of subjects are much sought after by his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. My heavens, that was a beautiful uh, He's a great interview. Guy. He had a lot Very to say. Good job. A lot of good things to say about Perry Mitchell, and uh, a lot of important things to say about the budget. You did a good job. Thank you. I enjoyed that. We're going to take a break and come back with the entertainment page, so please stay with us. Hi, Harold Anthony here. Gavin Christopher was born into a musical family in Chicago. His father was a jazz drummer and his uncles all sang and his mother filled the house with gospel singing. Gavin started joining in on a stack of telephone books at the age of three. After some time singing and acting in variety shows, he began playing in bands around town. In one group, he met up with another young singer whose name just so happened to be Chaka Khan, and together they formed the group Life, which ended quickly at just after it had gotten started. Gavin eventually spent a couple of years at the University of Wisconsin where he studied music and women. Gavin himself wrote several songs for Rufus in addition to a number of hit songs for Herbie Hancock, including You've Got Stars in Your Eyes, on which he sang lead vocals. One Step Closer to You is Gavin's most recent endeavor and was produced by Evan Rogers and Carl Sturkin, the team responsible for writing Stephanie Mills' Stand Back and for writing and co-producing Jennifer Holliday's Just a Matter of Time. Given this record's impressive, confident, stylistic range, as well as Christopher's rich, soulful vocals, it's quite evident that this will be the first of many popular releases. Here's Gavin Christopher with One Step Closer to You. Judge for yourself. It's one Step Closer. You know, this single has already made it up to number five on the R&B charts. Not bad for a beginning, huh? Well, for those of you who are appreciative of ballet, the finest troupe of dancers in Europe are on their way to our area. The Paris Opera Ballet, under the artistic direction of Rudolf Nureyev, will appear at the Kennedy Center Opera House for a one-week engagement, July 27th, July 22nd, pardon me, through July 27th. Internationally acclaimed for its impressive roster of premier dancers and superb corps de ballet, the 85-member company will be making its very first Washington appearance and will dance Rudolf Nureyev's full-length Swan Lake with four sets of the company's illustrious dancers. For more information, call area code 202-254-3696. And it's showtime in Baltimore, and the curtain is about to rise for the 16th summer for the 16th summer season of On Stage Downtown, the area's premier outdoor theatrical attraction. Eight weeks of show-stopping musicals will be performed by local theater companies every Tuesday night from June 24th through August 12th as On Stage Downtown moves to its new location in War Memorial Plaza near City Hall. All performances are free and begin promptly at 8 p.m. For more information, phone 752-8632. And with that, I'll have to say goodbye until next week. I'm Harold Anthony, hoping you all have a great Sunday. Well, one of the things I can say today is that this has been a hot show. Oh, Not yeah. only the video, but the discussion and uh, wow. <laughs> At any rate, if you'd like additional information on black atheists, there is a dial an atheist number. It's 703, which is Virginia, 280-4321. Dial an atheist. 
Okay. <laughs> and on the other side of the coin, the Baltimore Gospel Greats competition is about to uh, close up, so you better get uh, your entries in. There are three categories, one for small ensembles, soloists, male and female, as well as choirs. The preliminaries will be held July 15th, 16th, I mean, 14th, 15th, and 16th. <laughs> Or something like that. Something like that. But at any rate, the prizes are $200 for soloist, $400 for small ensemble, and $500 for a choir. And the winner will appear on City Line July 20th and will be the opening act for Andre Crouch at Pier 6 Pavilion. And very important, the deadline. The deadline is July 11th, and you must have your entries in by then. For more information, call 727-5580 or 444-3168. Now this is our last live show. We will go into summer reruns with the best of City Line with Survivors and Time of Time Terror. Of terror. So see you next week. That's our show. I'm BT Bentley. I'm Jackie Hall. Have a good day.